chapter 16. I'm going to look at one verse tonight, verse number 18. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the word of God tonight. Let that word go forth unhindered. I pray, Lord, that the enemy would be bound and have no power over any life that is present here tonight. He wouldn't have any power over anyone listening via live stream tonight. The Lamb of God, that you would have preeminence and that you would send your convicting power of the Holy Ghost by every way. Each and every one of us could stand to pull up a little closer to the Master's table tonight as he call it come and dine. I pray encourage the hearts, the minds, those that are feeble in body, those that are sick, those that are suffering, those, God, tonight that need your touch. Be the lifter of their head, I pray. Anoint me your servant. Hide me behind the cross. Let me be the finger pointing souls unto Calvary. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said amen. Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18. Jesus speaking here, if you have a red letter edition. And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You may be seated if you'd like. He said, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I want to preach for a few moments tonight, if God will help me, on God's expectation from his congregation. God's expectation from his congregation. Church membership is not a prerequisite to make heaven. Can you say amen? You don't have to be a member of any church. We, we appreciate all of our members. That shows a lot of dedication and devotion to your church, and we appreciate it. But, you know, being a member of any church will not get you into God's heaven. Although a lot of people that I talk with, to see them and hear them talk, you would think that it did just that. They'll say, well, I, I'm a member at the such and such and such and such. Well, that's wonderful, but that won't get you to God's heaven. How many know tonight you've got to be born again? If it was good enough for Nicodemus, it's good enough for you and I. If it was a requisite for Nicodemus, it is a requisite for us tonight. But it is, amen, no uh, church membership. It's not a prerequisite, if you will, to make heaven. However, church membership is a good thing in order to show your support and your love for your local church congregation. But our goal today is to concentrate on the things that God does expect from his congregation. So I want to take a few moments tonight and, and let us look, if we will, at a few things of what God expects from us, if you will, his true church. And you say, why did you say it like that, preacher? Because I tell you oftentimes and I reiterate to you tonight that I don't believe that Jesus is coming back for the church of today. I believe that he's coming back for a bride that has adorned herself and made herself ready. Some people say, well, that's just a play on words. And you're right. The true church is the bride. But not everything that calls itself the church today, amen, is worthy to be called the church. He's coming back for that one that has on that wedding garment that is without spot without blemish without wrinkle or any such thing and I say it often and I repeat it tonight to you under the inspiration 
inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul writes to the church and he tells them that they are the temple of the Holy Ghost. How many know tonight if you've had a born again experience, if you know the Lord and you've accepted him as personal Lord and Savior, then you are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, brother, that's pretty exciting, but it's also pretty sobering. And I'll tell you why, because we need to fear how we live. We need to fear where we walk. We need to fear how we talk. We need to fear what these hands handle and these eyes see. I love the little children's song that says, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see. Oh, be careful, little ears, what you hear. There's a father up above, and he's looking down in love. Oh, be careful, little eyes and ears, what you see, what you hear. Amen. In 1 Corinthians 6 and 19 and 20, Paul writes and he says what know ye not that your body he didn't say your spirit he didn't say your soul there's a lot of people that say well I gave my soul to the Lord I gave my spirit to the Lord well brother he already owned it in the first place and he'll be the one that either accepts it or destroys it but I want you to notice tonight what the apostle writes here and I want you to get a clear understanding of the word Word of God. It's not just about our soul. It's not just about the spirit that lives within us, but it is also about your body. He said, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which is of God, or which you have of God, and you are not your own. Look at your neighbor and say, you're not your own. The Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have have of God and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's brother we better be honoring God with everything that is within us every part of our being everything that we have we don't belong to ourselves, but the Bible tells us here that we've been bought with a price and that price brother is the precious atoning blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Mount Calvary for our sins you're not your own you don't have the right to do with your body what you please you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and the Bible tells us here the Apostle Paul tells us here in this verse of scripture that you better be careful what you do in that body because the Holy Ghost is dwelling inside of you and brother and sister he won't stick around in an unclean vessel he won't stay in an unclean temple that's why he said come out from among them and be therefore separate saith the Lord touch not the unclean thing and I will receive you he said love not the world neither the things that are in the world for if any man love the world the love of the father is not in him you've been bought with a price brother you've been bought with a price sister you don't belong to yourself you've got to know that word of God and you've got to put it into action in your life every Every single day of your life. Amen. The Bible tells us. Amen. That we are that temple. And that temple is meant to be holy. Meant to keep holy. Can you say amen? We are the temple of the Holy Ghost. And he said, therefore, glorify God in your body, in your spirit, which are God's. So the exceptions of God 
from his church. There are there's a few that I want to touch on tonight. And, and what what is it exactly, preacher, that God expects from his true church, from his bride? Well, I'm awfully glad that you asked me that tonight. First of all, God expects his church to study his word. You know, we've got to listen, there's a lot. I'm, I'm, I'm not pushing education uh, in a secular way, uh, but I'll tell you, brother, amen, you better be educated uh, in a godly way. Can you say amen? Uh, there's no excuse. Uh, the Bible teaches us there's no excuse. Uh, no excuse for sin. Uh, if a police officer pulls you over on the side of the road, uh, amen, you've been going 90 miles an hour in a 35 mile per hour zone, uh, he's going to pull you over, and I guarantee you he's going to do probably a couple of things. Uh, he'll write you a fine and he'll probably take you to jail at that speed. Uh, but I want you to know something. You can look him dead in the eye in your sweet little graceful way and say grace, grace, grace. Uh, mercy, mercy, mercy. And then he's going you can say I didn't know. I didn't know. I just didn't know. I didn't see the sign. I didn't see the road map. I didn't know. And he's going to say ignorance uh, of the law is no excuse. Can I tell you it's the same way with our God. No explanation on judgment day. Well, No excuse is going to work with God because he gave us a book to go by and is still the number one seller in the world. Can you say amen? That infallible word of God. It changes lives. It makes them free. Why? Because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God that word of God dwelt among us can you say amen that word of God is Jesus Christ and we've got to have him on the inside and when he's on the inside darkness will have to flee for he said I am the light of the world he said ye also are the lights of the world let your light therefore shine that men may see your good Good works and glorify the Father that's in heaven. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. In 2 Timothy 2 and 15, uh, Paul writes to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he tells him, he said, and this is for you and I, because every word is given under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. He said, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. He didn't tell you to pick it up and read it, did he? No, he told you to study it. We got a lot of readers, but we got very few studiers in our day and age. He wants that word to be alive in you. You ever read something and it weren't long, you went away and you forgot what you'd read? But I'll tell you, when you study something, you'll know it. I remember sitting at mama's feet. I was just a boy. My mama was a, a larger lady. She probably went 250 pounds. And you get her behind one of them switches. Now, we didn't have those type you got here. You got them little old flimsy things that don't really do a lot. My mom used one about that big around. And no, I'm not exaggerating. And she left some welts on me. And I probably needed a whole lot more. Was I abused? No, I wasn't. Like I said, I probably should have had a whole lot more. Mama loved me enough that she'd keep one of them by her chair. And she sat there and she'd teach me the scriptures. Hallelujah. Oh, I said, hallelujah. Why'd she do that? Probably I wasn't a good boy. No, no, no. I, I, I hate to tell you this. I got kicked out of two different Christian schools. <laughs> but I'll tell you one thing. God had a plan for my life. You can look at me funny if you want to. But God had a plan for my life. And I sat at Mama's feet. And she had that big old switch. And she'd train me in the scriptures. And if I messed up, she'd give me a pop. <laughs> Come on. I didn't like it at the time but brother it was worth it all now you might think it funny but I'll tell you if we'll train up our children in the way in which they should go when they're old they'll not depart from it they'll come back 
do it. We've got to teach them the ways of the Lord. That word of God's got to be in their hearts. I've never met so many ignorant, unlearned young people as we've got today. They can hardly quote John 3.16. Quiet. Quiet. Hallelujah. So God expects his church to study his holy word. We've got to know that word. When the devil comes knocking, you need that word. Jesus used it on the enemy, on Satan, on the mount. The devil came. Jesus had been fasting. uh, And the devil knew his weak point. Can I tell you tonight, the devil knows your weak point. Uh, Whatever it is, it might be money. uh, It might be a honey. Quiet, isn't it? But the devil knew what Jesus' weak point was at that moment because he had hungered. The Bible says that. I didn't write. Somebody said, well, Jesus didn't have any weak points. The Bible says he had hungered. He was hungry. He fasted all that time. So the devil come a knocking, uh, and the devil said, see these stones? Uh, if thou be the son of God, turn them into bread. You can make bread out of stones. Uh, hallelujah. Can you say amen? Uh, and Jesus just simply said this, it is written. Uh, and he gave him the word of God. Uh, it was the word of God that drove the devil ashore. He tried a couple other times, and he probably went with you too but just keep on giving him the word of God every time Jesus gave the devil the word of God he said it is written Satan uh, man shall not live by bread alone uh, but by every word that proceedeth uh, out of the mouth of God what the devil did not know uh, was he was talking to the bread of life Uh, he was talking to the living water I'm here to tonight to tell you we need that word of God inside of us uh, that we can set the devil to flight glory to God secondly God expects his church to live holy that's where we go sideways people don't want to hear you got to live holy to go to God's city But I didn't write the book. Don't shoot the paper boy for the headlines. I'm just delivering the good news. The Bible says you've got to live holy if you want to make God's heaven. I preach you, you're trying to make it by works. No, but works are involved, honey. Come on, the Bible declares that many profess to know God. Titus, uh, I believe it's Titus 1 and 16 or 2 and 16. says many profess to know him, but in their works, they deny him. Now, I want you to know works are involved in this thing. Now, you can't get to hell. You can't be saved by works. And that's what the Bible teaches us in Ephesians 2 and 9. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But once you've been born again, honey... You'll want to live right for Jesus. you want to please the master. you want to do the things that are pleasing in his sight. you want to live according to this holy book. Hallelujah. You say, well, you're trying to earn something. No, I'm not trying to earn anything except God's favor. And the Bible tells me I can do that. The Bible tells me my sacrifice can be a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of the Almighty. And that's what I'm looking for brother that's what I'm looking for sister amen I'm looking to please the Lord how about you so we've got to live holy in first Peter 1 13 through 17 he said therefore gird up the loins of your mind some of you need a mind touch some of you need a mind change hallelujah gird up the loins of your mind be sober and hope To the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. That means before you were enlightened. But as he which hath called you 
is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, it is written, uh, be ye holy for I am holy. And if you call on the Father who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, Pass the time of your sojourning here in fear. What did it say there? He judges according to what? Every man's work. There's your works right there. In fact, the Bible teaches us in Revelation 20, I believe it is somewhere around 13 or 14th verse, that every man will be judged according to their works. Come on right here. I've talked with them and said, well, you know, as long as you've got saved once, all you'll do is lose your reward. That's a bunch of baloney, and it's not in the word of God. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. The Bible says that all the abominable, all the adulterous, all the whoremongers, all those that even are liars, the Bible said in Revelation 21 and 8, they shall not inherit God's kingdom, but they, the Bible says, will have their Part in the lake that burneth with fire and with brimstone. Uh, you're going to have to live right and spit white to make God's uh, holy city. Uh, you can't get there on your works. It's true. If you've got only works and the blood hasn't been applied, uh, then you're peddling a cart that's going nowhere, brother. I said, come on right here. You're going nowhere in God. But once the blood of Jesus uh, has been applied, nobody is going to twist your arm uh, to make you want to live right. Uh, nobody had to tell me to dump my alcohol down the drain. Uh, nobody had to tell me to give up my drugs. Uh, nobody had to tell me to burn my pornography. Uh, I'm here to tell you tonight, uh, when Jesus saved me, he changed me. Uh, and I've been a brand new man ever since. Uh, I'm so happy. I'm no better than anybody else. Uh, but I'll tell you this, uh, he genuinely he saved me uh, and he gave me a reason to live uh, he gave me a reason to go on uh, and he told me in his word uh, go forth and be holy as I am holy that's what he's telling the church tonight uh, we've got to live different than the worldly churches uh, we've got to live different uh, than the world down the road we've got to live different uh, than those that go to Walmart every day and you almost need to have a mask over your eyes as well as over your nose and mouth quiet isn't it almost gotta have blinders on women with neck lines so low it'd make a baby cry quiet isn't it shorty shorts I call them daisy dukes Got their Daisy Duke shorts on or, you know, it's almost, you, you say, well, preacher, you know, going to the beach is bad. It, it, it can be if you go at the wrong time, but it's no different much anymore than going down to Walmart. Huh? And if you don't see them in that, you'll see them in their pajamas. Now I've got to hurry before I get in trouble. Hebrews 12, uh, 10 through 17, for they verily for a few days chastened us uh, after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, uh, that we might be partakers of his holiness. Uh, now no chastising for the present seemeth to be joyous, uh, but grievous. Uh, nevertheless, afterward, uh, it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Therefore lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way. But let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Brother, if you can't see God without it, it's got to be pretty important. Uh, looking diligently lest
lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel, one little morsel of meat, he sold his birthright. For ye know how that afterward, when he would have inherited the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place of repentance, though he sought it carefully with tears. Brother, this thing's a serious thing. There's people that think they can jump on board this Christian wagon train anytime they feel like doing it. But the Bible says, except the Spirit of God draw a man unto Christ, he can't be saved. You can't get on anytime you want to. You gotta get on when your heart's being dealt with. You gotta get on when that heart string's being pulled at. When the Holy Ghost is playing his tune upon your heart strings. You need to come to an altar of prayer. I knew that the night I got saved and I didn't care who was there. I ran to that altar. I didn't care who got in my way. They were either going to get in with me, they were going to get out, or they were going to get run over. I had the Holy Ghost dealing with my heart and I was sobbing like a baby. I didn't care. I knew I needed a Savior and I'm so thankful for the day that he changed my life. Brother, he'll do that for you. Sister, he'll do that for you if you'll let him do it. Hallelujah. We're called unto holiness. We're called unto righteousness. We're called unto godliness. Amen. The Bible teaches us. Amen. That we must follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. It said that Esau gave it all up for just a bowl of beans. But I'll tell you tonight, we've had some that have sold out for less. A three-inch cancer stick has kept them away from knowing God. Can you say amen? There's a lot of things that have kept people away from getting a spiritual revival in their hearts. Amen. We got the women now looking like men and the men looking like women. Oh, God, it's getting quiet on me right here. Amen. When the women's hair is so short that you can't tell if they're male or female and the man's hair is so long you can't tell amen if he's Johnny Cash amen or some haughty motati great God have mercy it's about time we recognize amen we need a revival in the land again we got women today that could kick start a bulldozer and we got men so sissified they make Tinkerbell look masculine I better get off this or I'm going to get in trouble. I can feel it. We need a revival in the land. God wants you to live holy. Hallelujah. God expects his church to be consistent in prayer. Hello? That's what God's expectation is for the church. He wants you to be consistent. And now that doesn't mean that you pray only when you're driving around Walmart parking lot. You pray that somebody will pull out close to the door so you can get their parking place. Uh, great God, that's not a prayer. Come on right here. God wants somebody to get on their knees uh, in earnest prayer again. Uh, somebody that will get shut in their prayer closet somebody that'll grab hold of the horns of the altar and cry for mercy again. Somebody that'll say, it's not my brother, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh God, standing in the need of prayer. We need somebody again that'll humble themselves and pray, that'll turn from their sin and their wicked ways. We'll see a revival in the land and we'll hear from heaven when we do that. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and 17, Paul writes, and he tells us this, three simple words. He said, pray without ceasing. What does that mean? That means you never stop praying. Woo, hallelujah. Now listen, there's got to be a time when you get in your prayer closet too, and I realize there's got to be a time you go to Wally World. But you better be praying down there as well. i never forget, I went in one time, I probably told you this, 
And I, I went in one time, Colonel, and I was up back in the lawn and garden section. And this, I probably told you this not long ago, but this little black lady was back there. And I always, we always greeted one. She was a door greeter, and I'd always talk with her and greet her. Well, she was back there in the lawn garden section. She saw me and said, oh, preacher. She'd come up running like they do, and she said, she said, oh, she said, I'm not feeling well today, preacher. I didn't wait a moment. I grabbed her hand. I said, let's pray right now. I grabbed her hand, and we began to pray uh, there in Walmart. And great God, uh, her and I both began to speak in other tongues uh, as the Holy Ghost gave the utterance. Uh, and we had a revival right there uh, in the lawn and garden section. Uh, amen. She got her healing, and God uh, changed her. I want you to know that's the God that we service, not anything doing with Brother Demers other than obeying the Spirit. Uh, and we need to be like that. We need to be ready to pray instantly. There's no time not to pray. Somebody needs prayer, we need to pray with them. Well, you can't pray if you're not prayed up. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. He said pray without ceasing. The Bible tells us that we are to continually keep the mind of Christ. Well, you can't very well keep the mind of Christ if you don't pray. And that's why Paul says pray without ceasing. That way you'll be prepared. That way you'll be ready. Come what may, you won't have to say, well, wait just a minute. I've got to go somewhere and I've got to get alone with God. And I've got to pray and I've got to do, you know, do this and do that. No, no, no. Uh, I never did understand why preachers would say, when you asked them to come preach for you, I'd say, well, let me pray about it. Well, I don't need anybody to tell me. I, mean, I don't need to pray to go preach anywhere. I hope the Catholic priest calls me up. I'll go down there and preach to them a little while. Glory. I said, we don't need, uh, if we're prayed up, uh, we don't need to say, uh, I'll take it to prayer. We're already praying about it. Uh, James 5 and 16 says, uh, confess your faults uh, one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Uh, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth mind. Uh, now I want you to take notice of a few things uh, in this portion of scripture. First, First of all, he said, confess your faults one with another. Sit back down. Don't go heading for the door. Get back here. I knew I'd lose them when I said, confess your faults one to another. Well, me, preacher? I'm perfect. Well, I hope you're striving for perfection. You need to be. Well, preacher... I've been in the way a long time. Yes, you have, honey. And it's time for you to get out of the way and get on the way. Thank God. Come on right here. We got a lot of people think they got it all wrapped up. But Jesus said, the word says, uh, Jesus uh, given the uh, inspiration here, the Holy Ghost given the inspiration to James. Uh, he said, confess your faults one to another. And he said, then pray one for, well, I'll pray for anybody except her. You don't know what she did to me. Well, you definitely need to pray. <laughs> Maybe she needs to pray for you instead of you for her. <laughs> Quiet, isn't it? <laughs> Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Why aren't we seeing healings? Because nobody's confessing anymore and nobody's praying anymore. Shout now. Oh, if we get back uh, to a life of prayer again, uh, if we get back to confessing our faults again, uh, if we get back uh, as the scripture goes on to tell us, uh, living a righteous, holy life, uh, the effectual, fervent prayer uh, of a righteous man uh, availeth much. Uh, you've got to live holy and you've got to live righteously if you want your prayers to reach God. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. God expects his church to be faithful in witnessing. And we don't like this, some of us. Acts 1 and 8 says, but Jesus speaking here, but ye shall receive power. That's the first part of it. How many want that power? 
He said, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We got a lot of people today that said they've got the Holy Ghost uh, and they've been filled with the Holy Ghost and power, but they seem quite powerless. <laughs> come on right here. We got a lot of preachers uh, that talk about they've been filled with the Holy Ghost, but they're powerless. There's not enough power in the pulpits anymore to scare a fly off a rotten apple. What we need is a revival of old time Holy Ghost. Come on right here, breathing upon us like he did at Pentecost. And then we need to carry that gospel out to the world and win the loss for Jesus Christ. Well, preacher, I talk in tongues, so does the devil. I don't care how well you talk in tongues. There's a genuine and there's a fake. Yes, there is. Don't look at me funny. There's a real and there's a counterfeit. We need somebody with the real and the genuine. And when you've got the real and genuine, it'll set your feet into motion. You won't have any trouble turning that person in the checkout line and say, Praise God! How you doing today? Let me invite you out to my church. Uh, Sister Demers and I do it all the time. She invited numerous people out to our, our Easter uh, service the other day. Uh, amen. People she'd never seen in her life. Uh, people she'd give a card to and put them in her you take as many of them cards as you want. You give them out to people. We got plenty more, and we'll order many more if we need to. Uh, but you get them out, and God will do the rest. God's growing this church. Uh, I know we got a lot of empty seats tonight, but God's growing this church, uh, and he's doing great things. Uh, and he'll use you, brother. He'll use you, sister, to do it. Uh, Acts 8, 1 through 4, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Uh, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church uh, was at, that was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Uh, and devout men, it didn't say you had to be a disciple or a an apostle anyways, we're all disciples, but you didn't have to be an apostle to carry the gospel. And devout men carried, uh, amen, the gospel. And they, they uh, carried Stephen as well to his burial and they made great lamentation over him as for Saul he made havoc at that time his name was Saul he made havoc of the church entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison Therefore, they that were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the word. They went everywhere witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, my Bible still tells me that he that winneth souls is wise. Hallelujah. I'm almost done. You stay with me. Notice that in the midst of the greatest persecution of that day, it didn't stop the church from witnessing, but rather it gave them a greater boldness than ever to spread the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ to the lost. If you've got the Holy Ghost, if he's got you, you'll do the same. Hallelujah. God expects his church. I'm preaching tonight on God's expectation from his congregation. God expects his church to be faithful in attendance. Quiet, isn't it? By the way, we start Sunday morning, Sunday school at 10, worship at 11. Sunday evening at 6, Wednesday night at 7, quiet, isn't it? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not 
forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. Uh, are we getting closer than we've ever been? Uh, we ought to be at church more than we've ever been. Uh, God expects us uh, to be in his house. If you know Jesus uh, and you've accepted the Lord as your Savior, then God wants you right here. God wants you in his, I don't care how much the world changes it up. Or, or changes it up I don't care how many live streams they have uh, honey they weren't for you brother they weren't for you if you're not a shiny if you're not one that can't get out and go uh, come on right here and I'll tell you how I know the ones that can and can't uh, amen the ones that just stay home and they're lazy they'll be down at the Wally World uh, the next day shopping I can't let Wally World go tonight can I They'll be down somewhere, uh, amen, shopping the next day. Uh, they'll be out with friends throwing a little old party. It's not hard for them to get to birthday parties or weddings or funerals. Uh, their only problem is they can't go to the house of God uh, when the church house doors are open uh, and the preachers are preaching uh, and the choirs are singing. Uh, they want to sit home with their bag of Doritos uh, on the couch in their cold old iced tea uh, sipping uh, and a uh, chomping uh, and watching once in a while uh, well I'll tell you brother uh, you're probably not gonna make heaven that way uh, for the Bible says we need to be gathered together now uh, more than ever before uh, I believe it's a tool of the devil uh, to keep people out of God's house uh, in these last days uh, so we need to not forsake that assembling together a lot of people, listen, I'm not picking on any of you tonight. You may have a real excuse or a real reason. Uh, but there are people that will come to church uh, late every single service. Uh, I would dare say you don't do that for your job. Uh, come on right here. You wouldn't have your job very long. Uh, and if you can train yourself to get up in the morning uh, and you can go to your job and get there and punch that old time clock on time time that you can come uh, to God's house uh, and gather together and punch that old devil in the eye. Uh, can you say amen? Uh, it's about time we gave him a black eye and we quit letting him have the victory over us. Uh, God's got some expectations uh, for his church. Uh, amen. God expects his church uh, to be faithful in giving liberally. Is it safe to come out yet? I'm just glad you don't have any rotten eggs or apples. The Bible says, given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over. God will give back. And brother, sister, God expects every one of us to pay our tithe and our offering. He said a shekel and a half. The shekel's your tithe. The half shekel is your offering. Uh, and nobody's exempt. Shout now. I don't care that you're on disability. God still expects you to pay your tithe. 10% uh, goes to God. It's getting quiet in here now, ain't it? Uh, young person, uh, if you get a dime, a penny of it goes to God. If you get a dollar, a dime of it goes to God. Uh, that's your tithe. Uh, amen. It's high time that we trained our children again. No wonder the church is starving. No wonder the church uh, doesn't have enough money in the bank to do anything. Uh, it's because we've not trained them, we've not taught them, we've not led them by example. You can't go to heaven and rob God. Wherein have we robbed thee? He said in tithe and in offerings. Can you say amen? In 1 Corinthians 9, 11 through 14, he said, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, Paul says, it is a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things if others be partakers of this power over you are not we rather nevertheless we have not used this power but suffer all things you know some don't care 
how much the church suffers or the preacher suffers. I'm not looking for a raise. Although if this cost of living still keeps going up, I may need one. But he said in the word of God, but suffer all these things they did lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Do you not know that they which minister about the holy things live of the holy things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar, talking about the priests, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And I'm so blessed. You all treat me so well here. And again, I'm not looking for anything. I'm trying to tell you that it's your responsibility to take care of the house of God. And God was good enough that he said, out of all that money that you get, I'm going to let you keep 90% and I'm only going to require 10. That's a pretty good God. I said, that's a pretty good God. R.J. Letourneau, he had one of the biggest businesses back in, I believe it was 1950s. Uh, made big excavating equipment and, and uh, had the biggest business around. And he got to the place where he said him and his wife sat down one day and so much money was coming in, they couldn't hardly stand it. The church was prospering because they paid their 10%. He sat down with his wife and he said, honey, he said, you know, uh, I don't know about you, but he said, I can't spend this 90%. How about we give the 90% to God and we'll keep the 10%. It wasn't long and she came back to him. Come on right here. It weren't long. She came back to him and she said, honey, I don't know what we've done, but she said, I can't spend the 10%. I, I never met a woman like that. Oh, great. I'm oh, sorry, Sister Demers. Amen. But I want to tell you, amen, God. God will bless you when you bless God. When you bless the work of the Lord and the house of the Lord. It doesn't matter your predicament. The Bible says that that little widow woman, she had nothing more than two mites. And she put them in that offering plate. And Jesus said, she's given more than all the rest. I told you this the other night. The lawyers were there. The Pharisees were there. They were rich. They had plenty of money. And the Levites and all the different ones were there, amen, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, amen, but Jesus, he did a little see in himself, and he saw her put in them two minds, and he said she's given more than the rest, because she gave her all. Hallelujah. Numbers 18, 20 through 28, and the Lord spake unto Aaron, he was the priest, Thou shalt have no inheritance in their land, neither shalt thou have any part among them. I am thy part and thine inheritance among the children of Israel, among the church. And behold, I have given the children of Levi all the tenth in Israel for an inheritance. Remember, Israel is the type of the church. I've given the Levites, the priests, a tenth part for an inheritance for their service which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Neither must the children of Israel henceforth come nigh uh, the tabernacle of the congregation lest they bear sin and die. But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation and they shall bear their iniquity. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of Israel they have no inheritance but the tithes of the children of Israel the tithe of the church which they offer as an heave offering unto the Lord I have given to the Levites to inherit. Therefore, I have said unto them, among the children of Israel, they shall have no inheritance. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes which I have given you from them, 
for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even the tenth part of the tithe. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the wine press. Thus she also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. If you needed proof of the tenth part of your tithe, there it is. Now, I don't say it to do my alms before men, but you already know it. Most people know it. I'm not looking for praise or the accolades of man. But I've, for 20 some odd years now, I've given 20% instead of 10%, and I can't keep up with God's blessing. Now, if you're just going to do it to look for a blessing, then you'll probably miss out. But I gave because God challenged me. I gave because God gave me a heart wanting to give, and I can't keep up with the blessings of God. They keep on pouring. You'll never outgive the Lord. Can you say amen? Stand to your feet with me if you will. I quoted this a few moments ago, but I want to read it in its entirety in Malachi 1, 13 and 14. Ye said also, behold, what a weariness it is. And ye have snuffed at it, saith the Lord of hosts. And ye brought that which was torn. And was lame. And was the sick. Thus she brought an offering. Should I accept this of your hand, saith the Lord? What did he bring? He brought the, the lame, the sick, the torn. The Bible said it had to be a perfect lamb without spot, without any blemish. But cursed, he said, be the deceiver, <coughs> which hath in his flock a male, and voweth and sacrificeth unto the Lord a corrupt thing. For I am a great king, saith the Lord of hosts, and my name is dreadful among the heathen. Man's blessing and God's blessing are two different things. Just because a person owns houses and lands does not mean that they are blessed. And moreover, a person who possesses these things can still be cursed, according to the Bible, by God. For the children and the Christian's prosperity is not with carnal things, but spiritual things. This is why it's so important that we are faithful in our tithe and offering. We're faithful in our liberal giving. You can be blessed or you can be cursed. God's expectations from his congregation. What will you do? What will your choice be? His word is what we need to be resting in and standing upon in these last days. God expects something from you and I. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again tonight for your holy, infallible word. Let that word adhere to our hearts. Let it change men and women tonight. You have so much for us that we're missing out on because of lack of obedience. My God, tonight, show each and every one your expectation. Show them what you'd have them to do. 
Lead them into the paths of righteousness for thy name's sake. Guide them with your eye. And my God, I pray if there's any here tonight that does not know you, that you would deal with their hearts right now. God, that none be lost. That none go to that wicked place called hell. You said I would that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Holy Ghost, deal with the hearts right now. In Jesus' name, amen. While every head is still bowed and every eye is still closed, no one's looking around. Are you here tonight? Outside of God's ark of safety. If Jesus called for your soul right now, Would you go to be with the Lord? Or would you be lost for eternity? In a place that God prepared for Satan and his angels. And any that would not accept Christ as their Savior. Hell is a wicked place. And once you're there, you can never, ever escape. If you're here tonight, you don't know this Jesus. He wants to wrap his loving arms about you tonight and change your life forever. Would you get out of your seat while he's dealing with you and come to this altar? Would you come and let us pray with you tonight? Jesus is calling, come home. Come home. You've been away too long. Just like that prodigal wasted all his life, all that he had, all that time with riotous living. He's now in the hog pen. He's in the lowest place of his life. Desiring to feed himself from the hus that they fed the hogs with. And he looks around him and he sees himself in that wicked place, that hog pen. And he said, what am I doing here? My father owns a mansion. My father has hired servants. And plenty to spare. He got up out of that place. Got up out of his seat. And he walked that aisle. Before he could reach his destination. Before he could reach that altar place. There stood his father with open arms. There stood his father to welcome him home. He said, Father, I want to be a servant. He said, you're my son. Yeah, but I want to work and I want to, I, I want to earn my keep. You're my son. He told the elder son, go and kill the fatty calf. My son that was lost has come home. Would you walk that aisle tonight and let Jesus welcome you. Would you let the Heavenly Father wrap His loving arms around you and say, welcome home, my child. Would you come right now? Jesus is dealing. Jesus is calling. He loves you. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, preacher, I've let down on some things. Some of the expectations that God requires for his congregation. I've been slacking on. 
But tonight I want to get it right. Tonight I want to lay it down. I want to get back on track. While every head is bowed and every eye is closed, would you slip your hand up and say, remember me when you pray, preacher. Pray for me. Is there one? Thank you. Is there more in this place? Pray for me. Remember me when you pray. These altars are open. They're always open. Could we make a place to pray somewhere tonight, whether it's here or in your seat? Would you find a place to talk to the Lord for a few minutes tonight before we leave? God's expectations for his congregation.